Hello everyone. I thought I would do a little video of me sewing straw today. I'm working on a bonnet. This is the tip of the bonnet. The tip is that back part of the crown. It sits at the back of your head. I'm using straw plate and cotton thread. Now the plate is it straw fibers. Most commonly wheat or rye. Plate can be done with whole straw or split straw. Whole straw uses the entire piece of the straw. The whole tube. And that creates a shiny and shiny surface. Split straw takes one of those straw tubes and cuts it lengthwise. And those little split pieces can be flattened and then braided together. Now the outside will be shiny while the inside will be matte. And when braided together, those will, oh, Clara, no, no. Oops. When braided together, those will create a combination of matte and shiny. Now in the 19th century, you could take two pieces, oops, you could take two pieces of split straw and put them insides together to create just a single shiny surface on the outside. And that was called Dunstable Plate. I suppose you could put the shiny surfaces together to have the mat on the outside as well. I've yet to find an example of that though. Now we're coming up on an area here where the strands of straw are all changed at the same time. And that's because this straw plate it's done on a straw braiding machine, which is an early 20th century invention. And yes, I'm getting knots. I'll talk about that in a second. The straw braiding machine allows us to have significantly more plate or braid than we would have if it was done by hand. And as you see, I'm getting some knots. This does happen. The straw likes to tangle. As, I mean, the thread likes to tangle as it goes through the straw. So you might be wondering why I don't wax my thread. And that's because if I wax my thread, the wax will come off on the straw itself. And that's will show up when I go to block the straw. So something I discovered a few years ago and recently had a nice affirmation in my choice not to use wax while reading the instructions given from the company, the straw company, to the women sewing the straw that we, they were not to use wax. And 
Now the straw that I use comes in hanks. This is a partial hank here. That's about half or a third, somewhere in between. It comes in different widths. And it's measured by the millimeter. This is about a six millimeter width right here. The narrowest that I have worked with is actually a two to three millimeter plate. And that's a split straw. It's actually a very tight split straw. Uh, it's not any easier to put the needle through that than it is through this one. And the smallest piece that I've made with straw, I'm going to have to measure that. I think it's about four inches tall. It's a little bonnet for a doll of mine. Now the smallest bonnet that I've made overall is actually a tiny one, less than an inch big, that I made for a doll, for a doll, when I was doing summer camp. One of the kids needed a little tiny bonnet. I thought I had made one for myself as well, but I have not seen that in a while. I did that by wrapping thread around a cotton cord, similar to the basket making technique, and made it in a shape of a straw bonnet. Now you can see here is my gray towel. That is where my damp straw is. Now, some straw company representatives insisted that straw should not be damp when used. I find this an utterly impractical request. as straw will completely dry out and break when trying to do a coil like this. You can use straw that has not been dampened, so right from the, the hank for the body and brim fairly successfully if the straw is supple. But the reality is, is when it's in a tight hank like this, let me bring this back up, see this tight curve here? And then often on the outer parts there's indentations here from it being tied and stored. You have to dampen the straw in order to get that to release. I do sew all of my pieces in the round, starting from the back. I work forward on bonnets or outward on hats. And then I block my pieces using original or reproduction millinery blocks. I have both in my collection at this point. 
when I first started, I was attempting to carve my own blocks from foam. And while I was able to get nice shapes that were accurate, I found they did not last as long as I would like. We're going to see I do not do a fancy knot. I just do a whole bunch of knots. I just need a knot big enough not to pull through the straw. Gotta say it's kind of hard <laughs> to tell what I'm doing through the camera. I will sew straw in very low light because a lot of it is by feel and rhythm. I find I am able to sew when I have a migraine that affects my eyes because I don't actually have to look at what I'm doing. I can close or just rest my eyes and work by feel. The challenging parts are the, the threading and knotting in that case. Realizing that I could do that was important for me because it answered a couple questions about original straw sewers. I wondered uh, what it was like to find the time to sew straw um, with their daily routines and yearly routines because the height of the straw sewing season is through the winter. In order to have all of these pieces ready after harvest, for the spring season. Now the spring millinery season is going to hit its height in April going into May, at least here in the north, New England, mid-Atlantic area. Which means all of these straw shapes needed to be in the hands of milliners in February and March. Which, going back, means straw sewers were working through November, December, January. So in the depths and the darkest parts of our winter. So I had often wondered what it was like to try to find the time around your daily activities and chores to fit in the straw sewing. And whether it was being done in the evenings by candlelight. Finding that I could sew in low light or without looking told me that even if they were sewing by candlelight or low light that was very doable. Let's deal with this little knot here. The ends like to tangle back. There we go. Now the other aspect of sewing through the winter I'm finding to be the cold. Now of course when you combine the cold air with working with something damp. Anybody that has aches and pains in their hands knows that that is a recipe for increased aches and pains. So I often wonder what these women's hands felt like. 
You can imagine the depths of January and the significantly below freezing temperatures and working with something damp. And now I'm seeing that I had meant for this to be a short video and I'm rolling into a long video. So with that, this is about the size of the, the tip of the crown. I'm going to be moving into the crown itself and then it'll transition into the brim. So with that, I will say thank you for watching and talk to you soon. Bye-bye.